Um, my name is Carol Bideau, and I'm the producer of The Weight of Money. And we have here today Robert Pelt, the writer and um, the person who um, created, thought of, and has um, written uh, the script. And so, Robert, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a retired uh, American Airlines uh, aircraft maintenance manager, uh, but I also am a, a commercial pilot. I don't normally fly the uh, aircraft in the background, but in um, the story that I wrote, I am flying that aircraft. It's a Citation 10. It's the fastest commercial jet in the world. Flies at 51,000 feet, just under the speed of sound. Um, I got this job uh, in 2008. A friend of mine had called me up, and this is after I'd retired from American, and said that he had one of these aircraft to deliver from Lincoln, Nebraska to uh, Angola, Luanda, Angola. And uh, he didn't need another pilot. He had two other pilots. What he needed was an aircraft maintenance guy. Now, I really had never worked on the Citation 10, but I had 40 years of aircraft maintenance experience. I went to school for a couple months, learned the airplane, at least the basics of it. And the idea was that I was going to accompany them to Angola and train them on the maintenance manuals and the basics of maintaining the aircraft. Uh, that was the original plan. Um, little did I realize that it would... Uh, descend into something quite different than that. Um, if somebody had asked me a year after retiring from American Airlines whether I'd be flying a jet with a hammer and stickle painted on the tail, um, I'd say, no, I, I don't see that in my retirement future. But in fact, that's what we did do. It was uh, bought by the son of the president of Angola, a company he operated. It was called Air 26. And they were going to use this jet to uh, deliver uh, equipment and high net worth individuals uh, to Europe, to China, to South America, back and forth to Angola. Uh, it sounded pretty reasonable. Um, although when I looked at the company, Air 26, I was surprised to find out they didn't have any jets. They weren't operating any jets. All they had was twin engine turboprops and they were just a regional Angola airline. So this is quite a step from a very basic twin engine prop to the highest performance jet in the world. Uh, but it was their money. Now the, the aircraft cost $25 million. They paid cash for it, uh, which should have been a red flag, uh, but I really didn't know how things operated in this business. I didn't really think much of it. Uh, they also did the interior of the aircraft and the aircraft maintenance was done in Lincoln, Nebraska. And that was another $5 million. And that was also paid in cash. Um, so I, I initially went to Lincoln, Nebraska after I'd gone to school to Cessna for a few weeks in Dallas. I went up to Lincoln, Nebraska and I thought the aircraft was going to be in a U.S. registry. I'm a U.S. licensed mechanic and U.S. licensed uh, pilot. Uh, first thing we found out was it wasn't U.S. registry. It was Angolan registry. Uh, the problem with that is if you have a U.S. license, you don't work on other countries' aircraft, not unless they give you some sort of special uh, license or waiver. Uh, so I called my buddy up and I said, um, you know, we got a problem here. I, I don't have a license to work on this and I don't think you have a license to fly it. Um, however, since it was the son of Angola that he was uh, the son of the president of Angola, uh, we quickly got an Angola licenses that we needed. It took about three, <laughs> three, Three, three days from their, um, their government in Washington. And um, not only did I get an aircraft mechanics license, which I needed, uh, but since I sent my commercial pilot's license uh, in uh, with all the other paperwork and my certificate from Dallas, the school I went to there, they inadvertently or whatever, they gave me a captain's 
certificate for the Citation 10, uh, which was quite a step up for me, actually. Uh, so theoretically, I was a now not only a licensed Angolan aircraft mechanic, but I was a Citation 10 captain. Um, now, my buddy, when he saw that, he said, well, uh, maybe you can be a cruise captain. Well, you, you're certainly not going to take off or land the airplane. Uh, but I did remind him I did do that in the simulator. When I was at school, I did fly the airplane in a simulator. So I figured in a pinch, I could, I could do the job. Uh, now, we left uh, for Angola on uh, January uh, 4th of 2009. Uh, we flew from Lincoln, Nebraska to New Orleans. We went through customs. And then from New Orleans, we, we flew down to Barbados, stayed there overnight. Uh, and the next day, we flew into uh, uh, Morocco and then down into Angola. Um, arriving there, initially, I didn't think it was going to be too much of a problem. Uh, was just delivering the aircraft, spend about a month with them training. Uh, but all of a sudden, once we got there, red flags started coming up. Things weren't looking quite the way I expected. For one, they had, we were going to be training five captains, uh, seven co-pilots and five captains. And I found out none of them had ever flown a jet before, okay? They had all flown for the Air, airline, Air 26. They flown the props. A lot of them had a, a lot of military helicopter pilot experience, but none of them had flown internationally. None of them had flown a jet. So my buddy had his work cut out for him, to say the least. Um, my thoughts were, if you just, just spent $30,000 for an aircraft to set up a high high net worth individual charter service, you would hire people from Italy or Spain or, or Brazil that are already certified in this aircraft to fly it. But no, they were gonna use the home team, strictly pilots from Air 26. The other thing, and I, I knew the, my buddy that I got me this job that uh, was in charge of the deal, I knew he's a little bit of a loose cannon, if you will. Um, he, he says what he thinks unfiltered. Uh, the first day when we were there, um, they had a big party celebrating the fact the aircraft uh, had been delivered and, uh, everybody right up to the president's son, a lot of dignitaries were there and, and, uh, they mentioned that they're going to use this aircraft to fly high net worth individuals from Angola to China. And the first thing my buddy tells them is, we well, shouldn't have bought this airplane, you should have bought a 757. This airplane's too small to fly that long. We'd have to make two or three stops. Not the thing you tell somebody that just shelled out $30 million for an aircraft that he bought the wrong airplane. But he was trying to now sell them another airplane. Um, one of the individuals we met there that was kind of interesting and intimidating was a guy by the name of Mr. Duarte. Mr. Duarte was originally from Angola, had connections in Portugal. He was more or less the business manager, and he was the guy that we dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis as far as um, anything we needed. Um, kind of intimidating. You have to have to remember that um, Angola had been in the Civil War for the last 30 years. And these guys were actually pro-communist. They were from that group that uh, after 30 years of war between the CIA back group, the communist back group, and the national group, the three groups decided, eh, why don't we just split it up? There's enough oil and gold and other riches in the country. We don't need to be fighting. So they stopped fighting, but really the communist back group had the most power. Now, before we left for Angola, uh, we did have to notify the State Department because anytime you deliver high-tech aircraft like this to another country, of course, you have to pay the export tax and there's a lot of other things involved in there. 
And we did also have a contact number for the State Department if anything went wrong. Now they said if something went wrong, you can call us. Uh, we're really not gonna be able to do much for you, but you can call us and tell us the problem. They weren't guaranteed they'd get us out of any trouble. Now, originally I figured what could go wrong? We're working with the president's son, okay? These are not criminals per se, at least I didn't think so. Um, they, they could afford whatever they're doing. It's obviously they weren't doing anything that appeared to be illegal. One of the things I remember them stressing is that they were going to be flying high net worth individuals right. out of Angola. I didn't realize, later on I came to realize those high net worth individuals was only one individual. His name was Ben Franklin. And they carried a lot of Ben Franklins on that aircraft. Now I spent about three months in Angola. Okay, doing the training. Uh, we had a lot of close calls. Flying with those guys was rather scary, uh, but they they did get the hang of it and they were able to fly the airplane okay. Um, it wasn't until years later, okay, that I realized this is after I pretty much had forgotten about this uh, particular delivery. Um, I'm reading in the Wall Street Journal and this is in, I believe, 2017, I'm reading in the Wall Street Journal about Angola. I was a little interested because I'd been there once. And as I'm reading the article, I realize the people that are featured in this article are all the guys I worked with when we delivered that airplane. And it was connected to the largest bank fraud in world history. Now at the time, they thought it was just electronic transfer of $500 million, which is a lot of money. And that happened in, in 2017. A uh, lady in, uh, uh, for the Wall Street Journal out of London wrote the article. And after I read it, all these red flags started to fall into place of why they did certain things the way they did them. And I realized that more than likely, from uh, 2009 to 2017, they were hauling cash out of Angola from the Bank of Angola, physical cash, to South America, to Portugal, to other parts of the world. Uh, that's what it appeared to be. Now, when they got caught, they actually made a, sh a change in the way they did business. The, the son, his dad wasn't getting reelected as president of Angola. He was departing. Okay. And the son was in charge of, he was a wealth manager for the bank of Angola. Um, his sister was in charge of selling the oil reserves to um, U S oil firms. And they were paid in U S currency, not electronic transfer or anything like that actual physical paper currency. And that was deposited in the bank of Angola and the son was in charge of reinvesting this money for the good of the people of Angola well, yeah. <laughs> throughout the world. Um, I finally realized, or I'm very suspicious, that what was mostly they moved out of Angola was using that aircraft was billions of dollars of the uh, country's currency. Uh, speculation that it's up to $20 billion now. Uh, the government is just starting to investigate it. That little one that initially tipped them off the $500 million, the son gave that money back to the government. He said, oh, sorry, I was stealing that. Here's the money back. And so they really didn't press charges on that. But that started the investigation of where all the billions and billions of dollars in Angola went. Now, of course, I had no knowledge uh, of any of this uh, going on later on. I, I bought their story that they were uh, going to try to do a charter service out of Luanda, Angola and fly wealthy people. Uh, however, the time when they were there, they weren't too interested in having uh, established a very good quality service for the passengers. 
none of that stuff seemed to be a priority. All they were mainly interested in is getting their flight crew changed uh, or trained. Um, so that's uh, what I did the first year of my retirement was that <laughs> little project. Well, I thought, what I thought was very interesting of the project um, when you first uh, showed it to me was, you know, although this is a very, very sensational story and, you know, you're, you're in Angola and you're dealing with all these billions of dollars or millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, and whether or not you knew, I mean, I know you didn't know exactly what was happening, but I just thought that there's um, this was such a relatable story because I think that all of us, every person could be caught up in a moment, especially when there's like this kind of a sexy world. And, you know, people always ask, well, how did you um, get embroiled in with Bernie Madoff? Or how did you get embroiled with these people? It's usually because there's a lifestyle or there's a set of circumstances that you're involved with that are a little bit sexy, that are out of your comfort zone. And I thought that, um, you know, this story just really could, everybody could relate to in some way, some form of what it takes for somebody to, um, to be uh, in in these type of circumstances, and you know, get out alive. And I think that what you've done with the the, the weight of money um, is is really really a fascinating story, and it's a lot of fun. And um, and I think it's it's something that everybody. Uh, we'll have a lot of fun watching. Um, so just explain to us, Robert, um, a little bit, what's the weight of money? So why that title? Well, the weight of money has to do with the weight of a $100 bill, which weighs the same as a $1 bill. Okay, it doesn't amount to very much. However, when you have a million dollars, you could put it on a carry-on bag. A million dollars is not a lot of money. But when you're starting to move a hundred million dollars, both the volume and the weight becomes a problem. And it's it's logical that you're not going to put this on an airliner, either as check baggage and obviously can't carry it on. And um I'm, they couldn't they wouldn't put on a ship. That's too slow. Trains not possible out of there. Uh, the best thing is, this is the perfect answer, is a private jet because it's private. And the, that aircraft I had calculated can very easily haul $100 million at a time. They probably wouldn't want to put more than that on at any one time in case the airplane was lost or something happened. So I think it was the perfect aircraft. It's also very fast. Most military fighters... Uh, would have a hard time catching us if we had a 10 minute start. Uh, they're faster for a short period of time because they have their afterburners on, but that's for like five minutes or so. They, uh, whereas we can fly a sustained speed of just under the speed of sound for hours. Exactly. So it, it's, it's a perfect airplane for them. Um, at right and now that air, Aircraft is just parked on the ground. Nobody's using it anymore. Robert, what is the weight of money? It's uh, one gram, which doesn't sound like much. Like, uh, like I said earlier, it's about this. It's, it is the same weight as a dollar, but when you add up significant hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, it adds up. Wow! And logistically, that's the problem. Now, of course, where they got caught is they wanted to start doing things the easy way, which is digital. But they weren't sophisticated to realize all the traps the international community has in place when you start moving hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, in their case, they were tripped up by a teller in London. Uh, one of their accountants in London was trying to move part of that 500 million, just $2 million from the, that account which was in the HSBC bank 
to another bank in Tokyo. And when the teller spotted that he had $500 million deposited in the account. <laughs> that petty was cash. Red, in the that petty was cash flag. account. <laughs> yeah. So that was a red flag. Interestingly enough, none of the other people, the bank said it fell through their software screening and it just whatever, there was a miscombobble. Um, but she actually was the one that flagged the, the account and that's what actually brought them down. Once they started looking into him, then they looked into the, the, his sister and they looked further into the company and the fraud is in the billions. Wow. So um, for the people that are listening to this extraordinary story and saying, I've never heard something, anything like this, what would you say to them are two films that um, come to your mind when you were writing it and how you lived it that would give people a sense of what they're about to see when they go to see The Weight of Money? Well, one of them might be uh, American Made. Right, uh, Tom, Tom Cruise, Cruise. Right, right. Where he was supposedly working for the CIA or something like that and bringing right. in drugs into the country. Right. Uh, of course, we weren't dealing with drugs. This was money laundering. Um, right. And we had no knowledge of it. The other one I think of is just because of the all the things that went wrong. And it does have a lot of humor to the story uh, is the Italian job that Ed right. Norton was in, in uh, Don, Donald Sutherland. Right, those, right. I wasn't trying to copy those stories. This is my own story. Yeah, uh, you lived it. And, and if I was, and I, I am a screenwriter, I've written other scripts, uh, but sometimes the truth is a lot more crazy than anything you could come up with as a, a screen story. Right. Um, to think, and, and the thing of it is, uh, we started out, it was supposed to be three citation, 10 captains, an aircraft mechanic. Okay, and before we left, one of the pilots, his wife wouldn't let him go. She read something on the internet about Angola, how dangerous it was. So I became the third captain because the contract required three captains and an aircraft mechanic. Well, now I'm the third captain and I'm also the aircraft mechanic. Once we arrived, one of the other wives found out from the other wife what was happening down there. And she said her husband had to come home. So that moved me up to the number two slot. And um, and Diana just wanted you out of the picture, so she let you stay. I'm only kidding, Diana. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't want to give too much away about the, the weight of money, but I really want to let everybody know it's a wonderful script. Um, and it's, it's a funny, I find a very funny script. And, um, but it also has just these incredible moments that, um, that you just wonder uh, how anybody, you know, how any of us would have been able to deal with those circumstances. So anyway, I thank you for including me in this ride on the weight of money. And um, I really love working with you. You're just really easy to work with. You're also very funny. And, um, and so anyway, I just uh, thank everybody and uh, we'll be sending, you know, you'll see um, written on the screen uh, how to follow us on social media and um, learn more about the progress of the project. And, um, and you know, send us questions, send us things, uh, we're, we're uh, looking forward to getting this on the screen um, soon. So thank you, Robert. Thank you, Carol. And uh, uh, we'll talk soon. All right, we'll see you. Yes, bye. bye.